to that looks like I, I have a slide here. Good, good afternoon, everybody. It's almost it's one o'clock uh, Pacific, so we should be ready to start. Just want to make sure that uh, folks that are remote uh, they can hear me. Just making sure that the logistics are working fine. Hi, Sanjay. Hello. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, I, I hear you. Yes. And I'm, I'm likewise, I, I hope everybody is able to hear me. Yes? Yes. Hey, Sanjay, sorry, I'm having some audio difficulty. <laughs> I think I have you now. I hear you, Kevin. Okay, I hear you great. Now. Yep. Very good. So I, I think, uh, why don't we get started? It's one o'clock. We have a busy schedule here. Um, let's see here. Uh, does everybody see the full screen of the slide? All right. Let's move to the next slide, next page. Uh, okay. Page number two makes it easy. Okay, so note well, and uh, you can see the policies that are outlined here. Um, Number one, uh, as a reminder, by participating in the IETF, you agree to follow IETF processes and policies. Um, and if you are aware that any IETF contribution is covered by patents or patent applications that are owned or controlled by you or your, comp or your sponsor, you must disclose that fact or not participate in the discussion. Um, also, as a participant in or attendee, uh, to any of the IETF activity, you acknowledge that written audio, video, and photographic records of meeting may be made public. Uh, personal information that you provide to IETF will be handled in accordance with the IETF privacy statement. And then you can see the rest of the details there and the BCPs that you can follow through. So please note well. And note really well. These are some of the additional uh, policies that uh, point to uh, making sure that uh, we all are at our best behavior and we respect each other. Uh, so please uh, follow the, the expected professional standards and demonstrate your appropriate workplace behavior. All right, with that said, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, these are some of the tips for remote participants and for in person. Uh, one important thing is that everybody that is in the room, make sure that you please uh, click on the, um, the sign on sheet, uh, which I know I'm not showing right now. Uh, and in, in fact, there should be a clip. Um, if you can pass it on the clip, clipboard. Okay, very good. So make sure that everybody, you know, sign in and also remote, uh, please make sure that when you use your online tool, you're automatically signed in. So you're good. Okay. Uh, next slide. This is just the uh, references. So I'm just going to skip over these quickly. And where is my slide? It's not showing me here. So the working group milestones. So these are the, the active working group documents. And these are some of the milestones that have been adjusted. Um, so we are, and obviously, um, these can be adjusted in the sense that if, if the working group draft is ready to move forward with, uh, then that can move forward. They are not tied necessarily to these dates here. If you're moving forward fastly, that faster, then that's fine. So the first one we have right now is that um, we have a submit the CDNI extensions to the HTTPS ECMI star in August. Did somebody have a question? That, that was me, Sanjay. I was just gonna mention um, with respect to ACME star, um, I think we had the working group last call. I, I believe we're ready to submit it to the IASG. I have, um, I updated the status to waiting for the Shepherd write-up. Um, I have the Shepherd write-up done. I'm just waiting for uh, Frederick to get back from vacation and confirm 
that there's no IPR per the note well, um, and then we will get that um, submitted on time in August. Excellent. And then there are a couple of other documents that we have that are uh, moving fast. Um, one is the, uh, the, that, the next one is the CDN exten CDNI extensions for capacity capability advertisement document. Um, right now we're showing that uh, to be submitted to the IESG by December of 2023. Obviously that can accelerate uh, sooner. <sighs> Uh, and then the next one we have uh, is the HTTPS TLS sub-certification uh, sub uh, delegation document that is targeted for February of 2024. And likewise, the RFC 8007 BIS is also scheduled for February 2024. And then uh, that is based on the current working group drafts. And then uh, recharter or dissolve and make the decision in, in November 2024. Any questions here? Okay. okay, if not, I'm gonna to move to the next slide. And as you can see, it's pretty crammed. We have, uh, today we have three uh, documents that are working group documents currently. We're gonna go through uh, those three first. And then we've, we have about four documents that are submitted into the working group. So we're gonna discuss those and potentially uh, see if they can be adopted into the working group. Um, and then um, we have also allocated time for open mic. There are two major topics there. One is the logging extension that Ben would like some time on it, uh, about 15 minutes. And then we also have a request from Alan uh, who wants to talk about the request routing interface specification. So we'll uh, cover those two topics. Um, so without a further ado, I'm gonna uh, go back to the first item that we have on the working group documents, uh, the CDNI capacity advertisement extension, and I'm gonna give it to Ben to run with it. And then we'll come back to Nir on the CDNI triggers, the RFC 8007 bis. And then thirdly, we'll have a, a presentation from uh, Christoph on uh, delegated credentials. And then we'll move on to the other drafts. So, um, in the chat, Ben is apparently having trouble connecting. I don't know if we have someone from me that who might be able to, to help him out. Um, we may need to, may need to switch up the order if Ben is unable to join immediately. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I don't see Chris. Oh, Christoph is there. Christoph, do you? Do you want to go or kneel uh, near any, any one of you uh, who's willing to? I, I uh, can go now. You can go. Okay, near. Um, all right. Do very you good. Know me well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, all. Let me see if I can bring up your document near. Okay. Okay. Let's start. Uh, this is the, not the first time we talk about the CDNI uh, triggers interface and second edition. Uh, our, our goal in this meeting uh, is reaching uh, working group less call. Uh, we will have a quick reminder about uh, RFC 8007, the first edition and the second edition that we already presented. We will then uh, go over three revisions, a new, three new revisions uh, we made for the uh, for the inter for the draft. Uh, the the revision are additive. Uh, each one brings another an additional value. Uh, we'll, I, we then have few minutes for discussion and uh, hopefully select one of the versions uh, as for working group uh, less call. Um, let's proceed. So RFC 8007 defined the uh, control interface and triggers and triggers which practically allows an upstream CDN an upstream CDN to manage a uh, content or metadata within the downstream CDN. And uh, it defines uh, 
the exact protocol, uh, creating triggers, uh, canceling triggers, uh, and the objects uh, that uh, and monitor triggers and all objects that uh, I used all around. And next, please. Uh, and practically in the second edition, what we, we uh, changed the uh, trigger object structure, uh, adding much uh, flexibility to it and uh, extendability, uh, and avoiding a new uh, and the need to uh, define a new trigger object every time uh, we need another. A way to select content to run on or thing like that. Uh, we also better uh, dealt with the uh, error propagation uh, when in situation of uh, cascaded CDNs. Um, and it is important to note that we did not do any change in the protocol itself. Okay, the, the uh, triggers protocol, the generation, the cancellation, the API, a part of the objects, the entire flow looks the same. And it was very important to, to preserve this flow and just uh, uh, create the new objects and uh, use them. Next. So uh, this uh, slide is kind of part of the, part of the change we did in the trigger uh, structure, trigger object structure. Uh, the trigger object was built of a type which said uh, practically what to do, X, for example, preposition. It, it then had a list of proper, a set of properties uh, to select uh, whom to run on, the targets of the trigger, and the CDN pass, which is used for a, a, it's a list of CDN that is used for a loop detection. A, what we did what we did here it, is we, we renamed the type to action we took all the properties uh, and uh, put them and them in the list of trigger specs a generic trigger spec uh, we added uh, the trigger extensions which give further uh, execution uh, instruction so it's practically the how to, to run the trigger for example um, do it in a certain hour, hour or so, and we kept the CDN path. Okay. Yes. So as I said, the trigger type was was renamed to trigger action. Next. And this is all just reminders for the what we presented so far. And uh, we added the generic trigger spec that practically a uh, Specify the target to execute the trigger on. On it has a practically two, the, the spec has two ma uh, main uh, items, which is the first one is the uh, how to run, uh, uh, how, how to select the content, for example, by URL, by uh, regexes, or something like that. And the second part is the trigger subject, which, uh, which uh, specify whether we run on uh, metadata or content. Um, it's important to know that uh, those, uh, the, we added a, a, capa a set of capabilities uh, and the, the FCI practically supports the uh, se uh, specify the trigger scope. For example, we support a preposition of met of content uh, using URLs, so uh, this uh, we added this to, we are adding this to the FC, to be supported by the FCI. Next, okay, and the extensions are the how uh, give further instruction for the, the execution time policy location policy. Next, and the last thing we did there is we change the trigger object we also needed to change the error object and the status object because they maintain an internal trigger object within them so uh, that's i think that's it for okay that's it for version 4 recap 
Uh, next. So what we did in version five and six, we uh, mainly started with uh, an overall uh, coherency ch check and alignment of the entire document. Uh, it was mainly in the document was, uh, we started with the original uh, RFC 807 and made a lot of changes uh, over it and uh, augmented the draft that Ori and Sanjay uh, worked uh, on uh, initially. Uh, so uh, we verified it's all current. Uh, we eliminated the TBDs and loose ends there that we have. Uh, we added new registries, IANA registries, uh, for the two aspects, to the subject, to the extensions. Uh, in this context, context, it's important to note that uh, we didn't add a a trigger, a trigger action IANA registry because we already had the trigger types uh, registry, which is we just rename action uh, types to action. So we will keep on using the the old uh, uh, registry uh, defined RFC 807. Next, please. Okay. Uh, so what uh, we uh, for the generic spec object, uh, as I said, we, we added the re uh, relevant registries, IANA uh, registries, and we also added new error codes. Uh, the error codes are uh, allowing the uh, absence in the downstream CDN to uh, specify, it, to indicate it couldn't uh, uh, pass uh, uh, the trigger to. to uh, an unfamiliar spec or unfamiliar subject or uh, issue with the actual parsing of the spec. And we are, so we added those two error codes. There's also, there are also registered, there are also appeared in IAN registry uh, of the entire, of the all code error list. Uh, yes, uh, Go ahead, Reggie. Uh, here from PicoNex. Uh, I just wanted to uh, confirm um, in the new error code that you've registered, um, you are allowing the downstream CDN to indicate um, an unsupported specification. Um, does that necessarily also cover cases where a certain extension is requested, but um, you know that extension either could not be supported or is supported but could not be successfully executed. Um, an example for this would be, say, an upstream has requested a, a preposition with a time extension, saying that, okay, okay I want it to be done within this time period. Um, yes. And downstream manages to complete the trigger partially. So I download some of the assets within that time, but I can't complete the entire set of assets within the time window specified. So uh, do we have some examples around how uh, you would indicate an error like that? Yeah, we also defined the e extension error code. Uh, it, it is not new to for this draft. It, already, it was already defined in uh, version uh, 04. So I didn't mention it here. Uh, I just, uh, this is part of the coherency uh, fixes that we uh, figure out those uh, error codes are missing. But the exten uh, uh, extension error code is already there. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, my question was in cases where um, it's not really an error, but it's it's kind of running out of bounds of uh, the constraints specified in the extension. So, it, it's not like it's um, a time that isn't supported, but I it's more I like a warning but i couldn't complete it within that time so how would i indicate an error like that uh, i don't have an exact I, I, I we i don't remember actually i need i need to get back to you with that we, we thought we thought about it I, I i remember the discussion i don't remember the conclusion so okay. uh, I need to get back to you in that. Yeah. So so maybe we might want to maybe add an example around these kind of use cases in the uh, text so that we have some guidance around that. Okay. 
Okay, let's proceed because we don't have a, a much time, but... Uh, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the extension object, we just uh, uh, added a registry for the trigger extension, the uh, location policy and type policy and such. Next. And uh, an, an additional change uh, in this draft is adding a status region, a reason to the status object. It didn't appear previously. It, uh, it's a human readable uh, field. Uh, it's optional one. Um, and we figure out it, it is needed for uh, due to the extensions. Okay, for example, if we have an extension saying uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this should run in a, a specific time, the trigger should run in a specific, specific time. So uh, we can give an indication that the uh, trigger is pending due to the time policy. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, I think this one is actually the most important change we did in the RFC, uh, uh, in the in the revision in revision six. Um, till now, we uh, discussed uh, uh, version two of the FBI. This was the term we used uh, uh, when we discussed this RFC. It is uh, this draft, the second edition. And we realized we are not actually changing the API. We are, we are just changing, changing objects. And so we are the, the high level object, the, the, mem, the meme type that are sent within the HTTP request. Uh, we actually gave the version to this object. We, uh, this, we, are, we now have we originally have the CI trigger command object. We are now having a V2 for it. And we have the CI uh, trigger status object. We, are now, uh, we had it and now we have a V2 for this object as well. Uh, internal properties within those, those objects does not, that do not have the V2 suffix because once you are in this object, it's, uh, it's uh, imply that you are using the trigger v2 structure um, and it's we also wanted to note here that uh, we the uh, object versions uh, are now can now be published uh, the supporting or supported object versions can now be uh, published via the fci we have a capability object for that next please um, now, as I said, we we took the CI trigger command and uh, and added the V2 and now created a, a CI trigger command V2 and the CI trigger status V2. Uh, and it's important to note that those objects are paired. Okay, if one is you is creating a trigger using the CI trigger command V2. The status uh, resource that uh, uh, would be created is a V2 status, and it's uh, and it stands for uh, in, in our, the way I see we see it, uh, it will stand for further version as well. If someone uh, will uh, define a V3 of the uh, of the trigger V3 and the, the command uh, command V3, it also uh, will also have a status V3. Uh, and also, actually, uh, we have the uh, backward compatibility uh, of RFC 807, 807 that we have the command without the V2 and that creates the status without the V2. Um, so the command, uh, uh, the command object and the trigger st status uh, object are, are versioned and paired. Uh, on the other end, on the contrary, uh, the trigger collection object, which is used to, uh, let's give uh, for, uh, for absence in the end to get a list of to the pathways of all its triggers. This one is not, uh, is, it's not uh, this object is not version. Uh, so 
once a, a, an app then request a list of a is list of triggers, it will get the list of paths that some may point of a v2 trigger and some may point of to a v1 trigger, uh, depending how the uh, app then created the trigger. So therefore, the, we didn't uh, mark as version the CI trigger collection object, and it's it, we actually did not uh, change this object. Next, please. Okay, uh, if you have questions so far, it's a good time to ask. Uh, otherwise, I would like to proceed to uh, version 7. Uh, have questions. Uh, so uh, you're saying that, that actually V1 and V2 can be mixed and matched? Um, how are we actually managing uh, backward compatibility? I understand you're saying yeah. that API is uh, the same. Yeah, they are not that. mixed. The, the version, uh, once you, when you use an object of V2, you create, it's paired, you get the status of V2. But we are not forcing the absence in the end to use only a one version of the, of the API, of the objects. Uh, for backward compatibility. Um, so same UCDN and DCDN may actually exchange V1 and V3 to be two V2 triggers. Kind of, I think it may create kind of uh, semantic issues there. So um, I, that's my first question or comment. And second is how are we actually managing uh, backward compatibility and then uh, V1 and V2. Again, API kind of it's only half half of uh, you know a uh, solution that okay API is compatible but if objects cannot be parsed it is in effect a new version of protocol no so the uh, the downstream CDN announce via the FCI which version it supports the absence CDN chooses how to create the triggers and the downstream CDN works uh, uh, accordingly so if the absence CDN uses the, I said it, okay. So okay, I'm okay, missing your it. point here. Yeah, so, but okay, I, I understand what I, you're I look at it as, as two separate APIs and the uh, absence CDN will use whatever, whatever it wants. Right, I kind of, do we want to really allow uh, kind of uh, UCN and DCDN uh, exchange uh, two versions of triggers for same. Is, is it really helpful or is it more of a complication that... Uh, I think um, it's more of a complication, but I don't want to force the moving. I, I don't know what the status of users, usage of this API. I, I assume it's not being uh, used uh, currently uh, a lot or nothing like that, but I, I don't want to assume that. So I want to keep on uh, supporting the old version. And actually the downstream CDN may announce it supports only version two or only version one or whatever. And uh, by announcing it supports via the FCI that it supports only version two, it can protect, it, uh, protect itself. Okay, so DCDN can potentially avoid uh, semantic complications by just choosing V2, for example, yeah. not, not actually yes. uh, supporting V1 if they don't have to. I, I kind yes. of, uh, but we may want to you look at basically uh, at what if you do allow that V1 and V2, uh, what happens if you send uh, preposition V2 triggers, but then you send invalidation V1 triggers? Is there something that will work? Do we have, uh, do we need to clarify things? They, they are independent. They are created two independent triggers. Why should they affect one another? If you're storing, if you're storing, um, um, again, if you kind of, uh, you have a way for DCDN just to say V2 only and that's it, I resolve that. Um, no, but, but I just why, there's uh, value in allowing that. The, the, I, I preposition a content using V1 object, for example, and then I want to invalidate the same content using V2 object. 
uh, V2 trigger. It can be done. It's the, the, the list of, we can specify the same content. It's, it's the same. The, the actual notation of content specification is also the same. We just change the structure. It appears like so. The, the, we have the same flexibility. Yeah, I'm saying that V2 potentially uh, can be used with extension policies to propagate more information about the content that can be used later for purge. And if you yeah. kind of allowing but kind of V1, uh, V1, uh, that will be just not work with something that proposition with V2. I think that that is yeah. something okay. that I didn't maybe not. About okay. Uh, so you would uh, suggest uh, that once uh, a V2 is, I actually not not sure it's it, it comes up only the uh, what happens when we define a new extension, for example. It may cause the same issues that you define that you mentioned here. Um, okay. I'm doing extensions, then uh, this extension should support kind of all, all operations, right? So there's something that would be consistent. Uh, but if I'm kind of kind of thinking about GGP2, it should be 1-1, one, one, right? Is that like you, you allow within same connection, uh, arguably it's not a connection, I understand, but kind of within same interaction, you're allowing two different semantics. And again, I'm just saying, rather than trying to resolve that or uh, or actually delegate it to DCDN. Hey, DCDN, you figure out uh, kind of what to do with that. Maybe it would be kind of, because I don't think there's a lot of value in keeping those two. Like either you have, if, if you have V1 customers that you already integrated with, work with them on V1, with other UCDNs, work on V2. But with same, you know, working yeah. with the same UCDN in both levels, I don't think it has any value, even for those who have implemented that. And I, do I, I that. agree, I agree. We can say, say that we can add a comment on that to the RC that uh, we at least recommend or something. Yeah, okay. Okay, next. Ah, okay. So, uh, version seven, uh, in version seven, we effectively split, uh, okay, we split it the trigger and cancel commands object. Next, please. So, so far, uh, the, as defined in RFC 807, the uh, CI trigger command object to uh, add, add the trigger, cancel, and CDN pass properties. Uh, so, when you wanted to create a trigger, use the trigger property. And when you want to cancel for a, 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 a trigger, use the cancel property with a list of uh, resource paths. And it just didn't make sense, at least to me. Uh, uh, to use the same objects with, uh, instead of uh, having separate objects that can grow, uh, grow and have uh, values of, uh, of the, their own. So what we did here next, what we suggest in version uh, seven, next please. Okay, uh, is to create a trigger uh, object and a can and a trigger object, object and a cancellation object. So the uh, we define the CI trigger command trigger v2. It's and it's a v2 because it will create a status v2 object, uh, which has the a trigger property and the CDN path property that is uh, used for loop detection or loop avoidance. Next. And we define the cancel object, which is which is not version because it can cancel uh, uh, triggers for different versions, um, and uh, it uh, holds a list of uh, trigger paths and is used for canceling triggers. Uh, I we didn't include the CDN passive here, uh, and as we we believe that loop detection here is not really relevant. You want to cancel a trigger that was already created and loop detection was already tested for it. And 
Okay, and, and what you, and if there is a loop issue, a loop issue, what actually it means, and what would we do? You won't cancel the trigger. So uh, we didn't include the CDN path here. So this is a uh, version seven, and uh, in version in version eight, uh, we took the cancel object and instead of uh, posting it on the collection uh, uh, absent CDN collection path, uh, next uh, we use uh, we post it on the actual trigger path. The, the actual trigger to be cancelled. Uh, uh, next, please. So we took a, a trigger, for example, if we have this path uh, with the one, two, three, and then uh, if it's, for example, this is the path of the trigger, we send we post the constellation object on on this path and uh, cancel the trigger. We lose here the ability to do a bulk trigger cancellation. Uh, triggers uh, cancel many triggers at once. Uh, for my point of view, I don't sure it's really needed the bulk cancellation. It's just moving the complexity from the absence to the end to the downside to the of managing the list and. I think it complicates the API. So, what would you apply if one trigger was canceled and that we couldn't cancel the other one, or thing like that? So, I think it's uh, more straightforward to keep to to remove this uh, bulk uh, trigger cancellation ability. So, uh, and that's it. Sorry for taking more time than than I should. I probably shouldn't allow question to in the head. The session itself. Um, so that's it. I, I would like to get the point of view, maybe later offline, and select the uh, uh, whether we go with the version eight with the uh, new API or not. And uh, the milestone we wanted to reach is uh, what Kubeless called. So I hope we can reach that. I have a question here. So, so the, the, there is a suggestion that the, this draft will go to the working group last call. Yeah, one of those, but I, I would uh, recommend version eight. But uh, um, uh, assuming the the changes we did they are acceptable. Um, I think I may, I think have, may, may have to you kind of our. Uh, uh, actually, in the in the cache management project in the CTA, we've been working with uh, V2 extensions, and there is kind of quite a bit of changes that we would like to add. So certainly, if this is not closed, we want to introduce that. I think we'll be ready to submit that uh, sometime kind of before the next uh, IETF. But there's certainly more uh, things. We adding policies, policy extensions. There are some changes there. Um, so it's really good basis for kind of uh, the meet, meets the V2 uh, work that you've done is, is outstanding. It really meets our needs. But we actually started using this, and we would like those changes incorporated. So our proposal, at least for planning purposes, to discuss that and see how those changes are incorporated, and then you know before we close this off. Yeah, I, I don't think we're ready for last call just yet. I think we need more folks to actually review. The current versions of the drafts, there are some threads on the mailing list that um, we'd like to see a little bit more discussion on. I, I need to respond to Nir as well. Uh, I think we are excited that you are actually implementing this and have ideas. That is helpful. That is always the best type of feedback. So um, we definitely are interested in incorporating that. Um, but yeah, I think folks should go and read the drafts. Um, I think it was. The work that's been done has been great, as you mentioned, and and Nir and Sanjay have been doing some, you know, some major overhaul here, which which um, for the better. So uh, I think we should just go and, and take this offline and and take this to the list, and, and consider what we have thus far. Sounds good. Yeah, I, th I think that that's a good good suggestion. So um, keeping, I think we've run a little bit over here now. Um, and I so let's let's 
continue the discussion on the mailing list for this one. Um, now, uh, I see that Ben is online. I'm glad, Ben, that you're able to connect. Um, are you ready for your section? Shall I bring up your slides? Ed, I'm on the I'm on my phone, so this might be a little awkward, but hopefully this will work out. Unfortunately, none of my computers are able to join Meet Echo for whatever reason. Hmm. But I think you're you're coming on fine. Okay. And I have your slides up then. So. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um. All right, I guess we're starting with capacity. Um, so this is uh, the first few slides here are going to be familiar to anyone who's attended the past few uh, IETF uh, CDNI sessions. The capacity extensions are essentially a way to communicate both uh, to advertise limits from the downstream to the upstream and to also provide telemetry so that the upstream can make appropriate uh, routing decisions, traffic delegation decisions, based off the level of perceived traffic on the downstream side. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is just a brief example of what the, uh, the advertisement looks like. Um, I don't think we need to go through this line by line, just so you can get an idea. Um, there are a number of dimensions on which you can uh, advertise limits, things like uh, network egress, uh, request rates, and storage object counts and, and utilization. Uh, we also have a soft and a hard limit. The soft limit is advisory. The hard is the limit after which you should absolutely no longer be delegating traffic. Not shown here um, in the example is um, the uh, current property to advertise a current value for telemetry that does not require going to the external telemetry source. Uh, next slide, please. So we had uh, quite a few changes from the previous revision, uh, in large part thanks to Kevin, because he did a, a, a very thorough review, um, finding basically everything that was wrong with that draft. Obviously not everything, because uh, I think, Kevin, you just uh, I saw an email from you. I haven't gone through it yet, though, uh, with some more fixes. Uh, but I think we're, we're getting pretty close with this draft to uh, a final state. So the biggest remaining question that I have uh, for this is whether we need an IANA registry for the metric types and the, uh, and the limit types. And to me, the registry is only really necessary if these things are going to be utilized outside of this draft um, by other things. And I'm not sure that's the case. I think these values are kind of internal to the capacity extensions. And the only, the only time I would see them being uh, added to is if we had another revision to capacity or we had some draft that superseded this capacity extensions draft. Um, so if that's the case, do we actually need a registry for these types? So that, that's an open question, um, I guess, to, to Sanjay and Kevin or whoever is an expert on that topic. Um, yeah, I, I, sent a, I sent some comments earlier, um, mostly NIT and this question about the IANA registries. I think that is the big one. If, if we don't think there's a need to have others be able to extend that and, and define their own for interoperability purposes, then we probably don't need one. Um, I, I look to you guys as the implementers, uh, whether you think that's necessary. If you don't, um, uh, that's fine. We, we just need to be clear on that. Right, I, 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 could, I could see a potential use for registry for telemetry types. Because um, it's possible we'll have a future draft addressing telemetry in a more general way, not targeted specifically at the capacity uh, extensions. So perhaps that that could, you know, be useful for the limit types. Though I don't see those being used in any case outside of this draft. Okay. Yeah, I think it's really 
if you were to write a new draft and specify a new type, do you want to have to respecify everything that was, you know, that's now that was in the previous version? Um, yeah, I, yeah, that's fair. Um, I don't know. I, I guess my my expectation would be if we do something more with this in the future, it would be a just a new revision that supersedes whatever is approved here, which would be a full complete draft. Um, I, I I don't really see. Uh, you know, a separate draft that's just going to add like, you know, one or two new limit types, but maybe I'm not, uh, uh, you know, maybe my vision isn't broad enough to accommodate that. I would, I'd uh, open it up to the, the rest of the folks, um, maybe send an email to the list just so that we can close off on this issue. Otherwise I think the draft is pretty close. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Okay. So we'll have a brief discussion on that then. Um, I'll address your ad additional comments that you sent. So maybe we'll have one more revision and then uh, I think do a last call, um, I would hope, af you know, uh, if we can do that between IETFs via the mailing list. I think, I think it's reasonable if we, can, if we can get a new version out and folks can review it and, and agree, then yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Sanjay? Yeah, I um, I agree. Also, I think the the draft looks pretty good. I think um, overall, uh, good structure uh, and completeness. So, so the draft is very very much ready. Um, just some nits. Uh, I also sent you some nits yesterday, uh, Ben, um, on top of Kevin. So, but I okay, think I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll look for those. Yeah, yeah. I think you you'll be able to you know work through those pretty easily and quickly. So, so the, I think the only question is that um, I'll, I'll take a look at the draft again from the IANA point of view and you know, feed, give my feedback on the mailing list. But outside of then you clearing up you know, these nits, looks like you know, between now and then the, um, before the next IETF, we should be able to move forward, certainly with this one. OK, sounds like a plan. Yeah, please, Thank you, ben. anyone else in the working group who has any thoughts or comments, um, read the draft and send them to the list. Thank you. All right, so I think next off is Christoph, if I can bring up yeah. this document. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Christoph. next draft, yeah, it's about uh, delegated credentials, so next slide. So the draft specifies how to uh, um, one MI and one FCI object, and uh, which allows to use HTTP as delegation with delegated credential in CDNI. So the actual, actually, the um, delegated credentials they just got an RFC, RFC number. So this is something that I need to update in the draft. And um, and the draft defines two objects, so the FCI delegated credentials and the MI delegated credentials. So next slide. Uh, so here you see two examples for those two objects. So the FCI delegated credentials is mostly there to announce the maximum number of delegated credentials that the downstream CDN supports. And um, and the MI delegated credential is just an array of delegated credentials where the each delegated credential is encoded in well in, in base sixty four whatever and um, yeah that, that's that's it basically quite simple uh, next line so there are, so Kevin sent out a lot of comments and. Um, so there was a lot of typos, reformulation, and polishing of text in the new version. And there was some um, clarifications uh, regarding must and should. should. So to, typically one was about um, uh, keeping tra track of the certificates or the uh, delegated credential and the expiration times and the refreshing of, of those delegated credentials. So those are should because there might be reasons uh, where the upstream CDNs don't want to keep track of those. So typically, if you have just a single shot deployment, or when you're at the end of, when you're deprovisioning your downstream CDN. Uh, 
another new thing is now that the encoding of those of some properties which changed a bit and uh, also I extended the security consideration section and uh, explicitly stating that we shouldn't um, or passing private keys typically is dangerous and should be avoided. Uh, and that's mostly it. Uh, so I saw that there were a few more comments that you sent out, Kevin and Sanjay, just uh, today or yesterday. So I will have a look at them. And um, and then, yeah, and then the next step, I don't know when, if it's a working group last call, when we can target this up, up for discussion. I think we have someone, uh, we have folks in the queue, uh, Rajiv. Please go ahead. Um, hey, Christoph, Rajiv here from PicoNets. Um, just mm -hmm. wanted to confirm if you've had uh, any chance to give out um, any thought to the possibility of using the new proposed uh, secrets interface um, to be used as a channel to carry the keys for the certificates going through this particular interface or, or through these objects. It could be, that's something that I, yeah, I, I it could be a possibility, but I think we need to discuss this, yeah. It could be, I don't know. If we could, if we could use this mechanism um, and actually define that in uh, the spec somewhere, that uh, while it is, recommended not to transfer keys through this mechanism. Uh, a potential alternate may be to use uh, RFC number, um, so and so whatever gets assigned to the protected secrets interface um, but, as a channel for transferring keys. I mean, maybe it, we should, currently as it is written in this draft, it's kind of out of scope how you get those private keys. So it could be outbound channels, or inbound, but we say that you should, shouldn't do that. Uh, or you have to be very cautious on that. So maybe uh, if one day we have a, an, an RFC or a spec on the, um, on the protected secrets, uh, then we can maybe uh, open this up again. But um, my approach would be that currently we kind of put it out of scope of this uh, draft. Uh, and um, say that there, it's some other mechanism which does it. So is, is, is there scope in an RFC to say, hey, this is out of scope of the draft itself, but um, this is a potentially recommended method of doing it while not no. specifying it as a requirement? No, no, because then you have a reference to a document that doesn't exist yet and that will hold up publication. I think... Yeah. Okay. It is correct that it is out of scope and we don't need to specify. There's nothing here that prevents us from using it in the future, right? But we don't have to say that now. Okay. And maybe after Protected Secrets is actually published as an RFC, we can always uh, circle back and publish an update to this specification calling that out. Or it can reference this specification if it wants to make a mention as a use case. That is also yeah. possible. But we don't want to make a forward reference here. Okay, got it. Um, my comments were, yeah, I, I sent uh, some more nits to the list. They're mostly nits. I think the, the changes since last time are really great. Um, we've done, uh, I think we've done a lot with respect to the, the security um, specifications around those secrets and, and what, the, what, the, what the metadata is and what it isn't. Um, I think we're pretty close. I would suggest that we request a sector pre-review just to make sure they're okay with it. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't. It's a short draft we can ask. Um, but otherwise, I think I think we're pretty close. Sanjay? Yeah. Uh, so I think, the again, this document also has shaped up well. Um, I, I just feel that you know I, I want to do one more review um, of the draft. Um, outside of the nits now, just to make sure that not overlooking anything. And I agree, Kevin, that um, having a security review would be helpful so that as the document goes up the chain later on, it should be easier. 
Right. We don't want we don't want it to get caught up there if if they are going to still have issue with the the, the private key being in there. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Christoph. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. So we're running a few minutes late, but I think we should be able to catch up. Um, I believe Glenn, you would be next if I can find yeah. the right slide here, uh, metadata overview. That's the one. Yep, and hopefully Kevin did the trick of uploading the, the one that you sent. Yeah, it was uh, just a minor formatting nit, but you know, these yeah. things get, get under, people, under, <laughs> under people's skin. Yeah, so here we go. Yeah. Um, just, you go ahead, next slide. Yeah, just kind of a reminder for those who haven't, you know, been plugged into all of this, uh, within the SVTA, we're uh, driving what we call our configuration interface work which really picks up on the metadata interface of CDNI, uh, both on the model, adding lots of uh, objects to the model, and then also um, creating APIs uh, beyond the metadata interface a API that was originally specified. So that's kind of just you know, where we're coming from with the SVTA. Uh, next slide. Oh, it's not the new slide, but that's okay. It's just formatting. Um, so this is the SVTA configuration interface. It's a seven part document. We put out an early version a year ago. This is a version two that all of the documents you see listed here should be ratified by the SVTA and published probably in another by IETF 118. I think in September is what we're looking for. Um, so we're moving these through the SVTA in pieces. Uh, this part two, which is basically a uh, list of um, metadata, new metadata objects sort of organized by category. We've broken this up into pieces. You know, this originally we had submitted this a couple of years ago now, and Kevin was like, you know, break it up into pieces. So these first three in red are the three we're going to talk about today. We submitted those originally as draft for IHF 117. And we would like to come out of this meeting with a milestone of having these adopted as working group drafts. Moving ahead, all of these we want to move through, and we have uh, a couple others targeted for IETF 118. There'll be two more. Um, and some of these actually do make some forward references to these, but they're really only for the examples. They're not dependent on them in any way. Just the examples, when combined with these new um, standards, the examples become more clear. clear. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of all the metadata objects that SVTA is adding. You already saw some come out in some other work that was presented, and uh, logging will have some as well. But whenever we decided, whenever there was no other document that was a logical home for defining metadata objects, um, we decided to put them here because uh, they are in the same theme generally as the metadata objects that were originally introduced in RFC uh, 8006. Next. Yeah, and this just puts the SVTA configuration interface kind of in context of how the flow works between upstream CDNs and downstream CDNs, uh, you know, where the uh, upstream CDN will query the downstream CDN for, for capabilities, that's FCI, and we will be proposing uh, an extended, an FCI metadata extended object that allows for some fine grain advertisements of capabilities, and then, um, an upstream CDN can either push metadata into the downstream CDN with what we're calling our simple API extensions on top of the RFC 8006 metadata interface. And then we're also looking at some future work on an orchestration HP API with much richer capabilities and integration with Terraform. We'll have to see how much of that we decide to move into the IETF, but that's the big picture of where SVTA is going on this stuff. Um, we can move on to the cache metadata presentation, unless there's any discussion on that. Yeah, no, cool. I'm, I'm good. Kevin, anything you have? Well, the goal there was just to set the stage that there are lots more docs coming. No, uh, I'm, I'm good as well. Thank you, Glenn. We're looking forward to it. Great. Okay. Um, so this uh, is the uh, version one update to the cache control metadata that was presented at, at 117. Um, yeah, we can skate by this. So we, we did, 
yeah, we had originally done 116. Here's 117. Um, these are really just go beyond the relatively simple cash policy was, that was defined in 8006, adding the ability to, to do negative responses, set cash policies, both internal to the downstream CDN and external meaning for the downstream client, the, the user agent typically. Um, yeah, so go ahead and we'll go to the next slide here. Yeah, so Kevin gave uh, version 00, zero a real thorough review and we've addressed everything that Kevin brought up. This is just sort of the highlights of the bigger things that Kevin had brought up. Um, trying to think if I want to highlight anything particular on here. Yeah, there was some confusion about whether values were strings or integers or enumerations. We clarified all of that. Um, we added some examples that are clarifications as well, cleaned up a lot of language, uh, eliminated the incorrect statement that, that this was extending in 006 because it really is just new objects. Um, so that's about that, go ahead. I think what I do here is, yeah, because this is what a cache policy looks like, basically just setting internal and external values that either can be, in this example, the five means to five seconds, whereas external is an enumerated value. So each of these internal and external properties can be one of a handful of enumerated values or a string that's interpreted as a, a integer number of seconds. Um, what I'd like to do though at this point, Sanjay, could you bring up the draft actually? Oh, the previous slide? No, actually the draft itself. Oh, the draft. I, I, I think I put a link to it in the chat. Because there's an example I want to show. I just I didn't get a chance to put it into these slides, but it, it illustrates a point that I think Kevin had brought up in his original uh, review. Is that possible to bring up the uh, I'm making you do an audible uh, here? Or should I share my screen with it? Or what's the best way? Yeah, maybe you can share um, your screen. If you, if you make I'll do request. that now. Okay. We're uh, asked to share, yep. Yes. Uh, oh, I can even get to pick which tab I want to share. Cool. Oh, actually, I picked the wrong. Um, okay. What are you yes, seeing? I, I see. The oh, that's okay. I picked the wrong tab, but th this will be this will do. So that's fine. Just hold on a second. Yeah, can you see this example here? Um, Glenn, you could just paste the URL into this tab and load it. Uh, that'll bring the draft up in this tab that you're already sharing. Oh, uh, well, this is fine. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to read, but uh, I see the screen. Um, they better. Yeah, a little bit better. Yeah, so the idea here, and this is something Kevin had brought up that, you know, imagine, there we go, we get a response from an origin an upstream CDN. And we want to see if it's in, in my example here, if it's a 200 response then set one type of cash policy. In this example, you know, it's a successful 200 is good. Um, so let's go ahead and cash for 300 seconds, both internally in RCDN and externally, you know, downstream. So that may be a typical, you know, five minute cash on a good response. However, um, if we get a 503 or a 504 from the origin, then we may want to just set a five second cash policy and force that regardless of any cash policy that may have come from the origin. So this is an example of combining this new uh, MI cash policy object with processing stages, which will be introduced uh, in the next uh, IETF meeting. It's a separate one of those, uh, those parts I had mentioned. And that will, um, I think, address Kev Kevin's uh, concern about how you can set multiple different policies based on different status responses. That was that for, hopefully that worked out. A any questions or discussion on that?
And, you know, we feel that th this draft is actually one minor clarification we added in the SVTA version since we uploaded this. Uh, but we think uh, this is essentially ready for, you know, to be adopted by the working group. Um, let's go to the next one. This is the edge control. Okay. And I'm presenting this on behalf of Alfonso. He's the primary author on this, but couldn't make it. I'm the secondary author. Um, so let's go ahead again. This will just be very quick. Next slide. Um, yeah, so these are a set of um, objects that really define uh, processing on the edge for uh, cached responses. Um, the bulk of it really is around cores, policies, but there's also directives about whether the uh, downstream CDN should be allowed to compress, like GZIP compression of response that may have come from an upstream CDN uncompressed. And then there's some client, limited client connection control metadata that talks about timeouts. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so that's pretty much what I just talked about here. Right, next slide, go ahead. Yeah, so very minor changes from version 00. I don't believe this one ever got the serious, detailed, meticulous going over from Kevin that, that some of the others had. Uh, we could probably use you to give it that kind of pass, Kevin. But um, we did take the same, a lot of the feedback we got on other documents applied to this. So we applied that feedback as well. Um, we had had another object in here, MI traffic type. Uh, you know, it might be a value like live streaming or VOD streaming or what have you that can be interpreted as a downstream CDN, you know, that wishes is appropriate for them. We, we eliminated that. That's going to be uh, showing up in a different document at a different time. This was just not a great place to put that. Um, but other than that, really very few changes from zero, zero. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and really, like I said, the bulk of the cross-origin policy is, is directives for downstream CDN on how to either uh, generate synthetic responses, you know, in the uh, cores sort of dialogues that need to go on, or to synthetically generate uh, cores response headers on behalf of the upstream CDN. Um, and that's the bulk of it. Everything else we really talked about last time, so there's no reason to rehash it here. You can just kind of go through. And next, yeah, we've, we've, we've discussed all this before. We handle both the simple and advanced cores cases. Uh, this we talked about before, that was you know, allowing compression, which I had mentioned, next. And then client access control, really just an ability to um, set timeout values and keep alive values on client connections for downstream. And I think that's, that's it. So, um, Ben will now present the third in this configuration interface set, uh, which is uh, the protecting private features metadata. But as I said, we'd like to come out of this uh, with you know, all three of these uh, adopted by the uh, working group, and then we can start you know, moving some more uh, drafts in. That's it for me. Thank you, ahead, Ben. Um, so even though I finally got in with a computer, my connection seems to be really bad and the slides aren't really loading for me. So I'm going to reference a local copy of my slides and just trust that uh, whatever you're seeing is what I'm seeing. So um, I'm going to move to slide number two. Objectives. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, hopefully I have the, the same version as what, as what you're seeing, but even if it's not, should should be okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we've, we've got three, um, three bullets on the objectives. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the whole idea with this, the secrets metadata is to allow an exchange of values that should be hidden, but we, we don't want to include them, uh, you know, directly in the, the advertisement or the configuration metadata. So it's a bi-directional mechanism to allow the upstream to tell the downstream or the downstream to tell the upstream, hey, here's a, you know, access token or here's a encryption key that you can use for whatever purpose. So to do that, um, we've defined a number of new objects. If we can go to slide three, please. Okay, these are the MI secret store slide. Okay, um, yeah. So there are uh, 
there were two ways that we decided to, to do this. Um, one is we wanted to be able to reference existing, you know, enterprise style external secret stores that organizations use today. Uh, the one we've, we've included explicit support for explicit support for so far is HashiCorp Vault. There are a number of solutions. Uh, I expect we'll incorporate uh, the majority of those into here with explicit configuration objects. Uh, but that's an example of an external store where in the configuration data, you're just referencing a store endpoint somewhere else and saying, you know, here's the key or here's the path to that, to that value as stored elsewhere. The other mechanism is embedded directly inside of the uh, advertisement or configuration document. Um, to do that, we're using uh, CMS messages, which is uh, an RFC from two decades ago, originally devised for uh, encrypted email, but it's a fairly generic format that's well specified. So uh, seemed like a good idea to reuse that here rather than defining our own thing. Um, so uh, the secret store just defines the metadata around how those secrets are accessed, uh, you know, the endpoint or the format that the secret is in. Uh, in addition to CMS, there's also clear text for uh, testing purposes. Uh, you know, if you're in the lab, you don't need something to actually be encrypted, but you still want to utilize the secret objects in the same way as you would in a production environment. Uh, slide four, please. Yeah, that's uh, MI secret value. value. I'm sorry? Yeah, go, go ahead. I was just reading the title there. OK. Um, and my secret value is the object that's actually embedded inside of other uh, FCI or MI objects uh, in place of a, you know, a plain text string. Now it's an object instead that references the, uh, the secret itself along with a reference to the store that has the configuration for how the secret should be decoded. Um, we have examples here, both of a external HashiCorp vault secret, which specifies a path. Remember that endpoint is specified in the store configuration and an example of an embedded secret. So that, uh, you know, that big blob you see there is the CMS message base 64 encoded. Uh, slide five, please. Uh, so uh, slide five refers to the secret certificate object. Uh, so this is utilized only in the case of the embedded store type where we need to communicate the certificate that's used to encrypt the values. So if I'm the upstream and you're the downstream and I want you to send secrets to me, then first I give you my certificate and then you reference that certificate from your store configuration to say, this is the cert that I'm using to encrypt these embedded messages. Uh, it's fairly simple, straightforward workflow. Uh, and all of these workflows are detailed explicitly in the draft. Uh, slide six, please. Um, so uh, rather than redefining identical objects on both sides, uh, we define them once as MI objects. And then for utilizing those same objects on the FCI side, there's a capability that wraps the MI object. So it's only defined once. On uh, slide seven. Very minor changes from the previous revision. Um, we had marked it as updating 8006 and 8008. That was incorrect, so that's fixed now. Uh, there are some minor text fixes. And the actual addition is a timeout property on secret value. Um, previously, there was no way to know how often you should go back to the store uh, to retrieve a new version of the secret in question. Some backends, like HashiCorp Vault, may have a expiration date explicitly associated with a secret, um, but that's not necessarily the case, and we wanted to provide a way to specify that in line with the, uh, with, with the object. Um, so that's it. Any questions? Uh, 
I'll just add also that all three of these docs, including this one, all got a, a SVPA tech writer pass since the first time as well. So yep. that's part of the clean. Um, all right. So well, I, I would like to, uh, um, if I could, ask for consideration for adoption um, for this document uh, because it's utilized in quite a number of other drafts that are in progress right now. Um, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, a prerequisite to a number of other things that we want to do. Um, and I guess the only, the only impediment to asking for adoption is that there hasn't really been a whole lot of commentary from the group on it. So I'm not sure if that's just because it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have any problems or people just haven't had the time to give it a thorough review yet. Um, I mean, if it's the former, then I definitely would like to ask for adoption. Yeah, I think so. I haven't had a chance to to read the updated drafts. Um, in principle, I think all of these are useful things, and I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to add these metadata objects to to CDNI. I guess I have the same question about you know have people read the drafts, um, and I'm wondering if we can take a poll. Uh, in the old days, we would hum, but I guess Mideco has a show of hands tool. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we can try this. I'm going off script, Sanjay. No, that's yeah, and Kevin, point. I would like to sort of cut in. I, I would like to also, you know, propose that those first two that I presented be adopted as well. We think those are ready. Understood. Understood. I guess I'd just like to to get an idea of how many folks actually have read. Um, if we could do kind of a show of hands, um, and and uh, obviously, if you've read it and you support it, that's great. Um, we will confirm on the list for sure. But um, uh, let me see if I can make the show of hands tool work. Did that work? Yes, it worked. Yeah, so please vote. If you've read the cache control metadata, um, please raise your hand. Oh, I should raise my hand. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, that's good. I'm going to do another one. Uh, how do I end? And then I'm going to do a second one. Who has read the edge control? seven people responding. Everyone's really reluctant to click the button. Not as many have read. Oh. And by the way, I, I, I know that there are other folks in the SVTA that are unfortunately not here on the call that have also read it. So we would want them to chime in. I know I've, I've seen a couple of emails. Um, Joav, for example, he, I believe he has sent in the mailing list, um, but he's not here on the call. Understood. This is obviously, this is just for folks who are in the room today, but um, it's a, it's at least a, you know, a rough idea. Okay, and a lot more on the secrets. I'd have to say absolutely nothing is more interesting for someone to dig into than a secret. That's why it <laughs> gets so much eyeball. Agreed. Okay. All right, that's good. I think um, how many people are in the room? 20 people in the room, eight people roundabout voted. Um, so that's, that's not bad. I think we can take it to the list. Um, Sanjay, do you think that's, that's sufficient for having read? I do encourage people to please go out and read them. And if you have comments, please do post it to the list. Uh, I will 
go and, and read the updated versions myself and post some comments to the list. Likewise, I will also be reading these the three latest updated document and putting my comments on. Um, okay, I um, Sanjay and I will discuss afterwards how we want to how we want to proceed with these, but I, I don't see any major red flags at the moment. Small request, which is that um, if we could set perhaps a date or a deadline for commentary before consideration for adoption, and maybe that will help encourage people to uh, get a move on with sharing their commentary um, rather than putting it off. That's a great idea. Um, we'll, we'll send a broadcast out to the list after the meeting. Agree. Who's up next? All right, so I think we have, uh, Alan, we have you next here on the named footprint. I'm gonna bring up the document. All yours, Alan. Okay, uh, next slide, naturally. Um, right, so, so um, uh, again, th this is a, a kind of a recap uh, and a bit of change of uh, what, what I presented uh, at the previous session. Um, again, um, kind of with several use cases, we see the need for uh, more advanced footprint capabilities, meaning that uh, examples include um, um, when you have like disaggregated distinct networks under common DCDN management. So you need to kind of manage basically different sub CDNs under one umbrella. Uh, use cases when you have edge and core cache layers. So maybe distributed even home last mile cache layers have different function capabilities. We need to be addressed differently. Um, geographical requirements, GDPR or similar legislation. And uh, to address that, uh, we felt that we need to have um, kind of uh, to move beyond basically uh, in, in the FCI today, which is footprint capabilities interfaces, really capabilities qualified. So footprints are not actually standalone objects that can be managed and addressed in FCI. So we need to do this uh, within FCI to uh, allow uh, kind of. Uh, stable reference to what footprints are versus have different capabilities state their own footprints in a non-consistent manner uh, and allow also cross inter uh, cross interface usage so we can actually use this not just within fci but also within configuration interface and other interfaces uh, so that's kind of um, uh, that's the main i think uh, driver and that's why we kind of the whole kind of effort that was named, called name footprint, so we can have them uh, as absolute objects that can be referenced. Uh, but additionally, uh, these use cases uh, required some uh, more advanced capabilities of how we define footprints, so the um, more complex logic there, uh, and also support for footprint that are changing very dynamically, sort of on the network basis, kind of when you have uh, kind of parts of the network uh, changing uh, kind of on, you know, on, on rapid basis. Um, so that's where we are. Next slide. That's why. Um, so the changes that uh, we're proposing is uh, that kind of, again, FCI is already the natural home. So we want to extend FCI uh, to add uh, more um, kind of API methods to uh, allow uh, advertising of footprints separately from capabilities. Uh, and they, that such advertisement could be done uh, uh, jointly. So we can actually get a kind of scrape and get all footprints, but also uh, potentially query individual footprints because maybe not you as UCD are not interested in all the footprints. You only want one uh, or one, one uh, that, that, that done different timing. Uh, that sh hierarchy should be supported. Clearly clear requirement for building a hierarchy there. Um, namespace, so we can actually uh, so provide different breakdown depending on uh, types of traffic or kind of host names and other other kind of, uh, so not all traffic necessarily 
is uh, broken down in the same way and managed. Uh, so you can actually have uh, different overlays uh, and support for client side caching. So you can actually cache those footprints on the ECDN side and uh, kind of renew that and to provide support for uh, caching of this, particularly important for dynamically changing footprints. Um, so uh, that kind of as a result, the overall CDNI operation mode is changing. So that will include uh, kind of retrieval of footprints separately from capabilities. That's a new thing and also periodic refreshment. And we're also looking to add two new footprint types to the registry. One is name footprint, which is a footprint that is uh, kind of uh, defined elsewhere. So referring the footprint as opposed to defining that inline to um, refer to the, uh, uh, to the advertising. And also we want to adopt uh, the metadata expression language ML uh, to uh, be able to uh, express uh, complex footprint definitions in a concise and flexible manner. Uh, lastly, changes include is the ability to, for some uh, 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 sources of footprints to be able to define a source. So when we say ASN, for example, uh, by whose definition is that? When we say ge geography, country, and so on, uh, when you're lo looking at actually uh, translating that back to IP address and back, you have different sources. And I think it's important for, for the two parties to align uh, on, on that definition. Uh, so UCDN, DCDN talking, and DCDN says US, and UCDN should have the same definition. Again, 99% of the cases, definition is the same, but those cracks uh, then, and discrepancy that may exist are uh, may lead to uh, traffic delegation issues and so on. So it's important to uh, allow um, kind of specifying a source of definition there uh, for anything but IP address. IP, IP address is clearly uh, self-defining. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, so those are the, the, the new verbs we're pro proposing in, in the API. So, so under FCI, providing new, new API methods and allowing uh, similarly to uh, uh, host name, host passes, so a, a hierarchy of namespace and, and footprint, so you can actually get individual footprint as well. Um, next slide. Uh, that's an example of named footprint. I just want to point out that the footprint value here is actually a reference to a URL where that footprint is defined. So within, let's say in this case, uh, configuration, uh, an example of my private feature list. So um, say, well, that that uh, feature is available in this footprint. And that's, there is a definition where you go and can find uh, the definition of what footprint is. Um, um, next slide. So uh, hierarchy, kind of the the one of the important things is that we define explicit hierarchy in the advertising because why? Because there is no way really to do implicit. Like you, for example, you can do with routing tables and IP addresses. You can actually do some implicit uh, logic, kind of what that comes first. Uh, in footprints, we're combining different footprint types, so uh, there's not not necessarily clear which one is the kind of is, uh, which one is a parent, which one is a child. So the proposed structure will define hierarchy explicitly and uh, the root footprint will include um, all footprints below that and potentially there's kind of uh, many levels of hierarchy would be possible um, uh, so and uh, importantly i think that uh, all children footprints are within the parent footprint but it's not necessarily sum of all footprints so i can have some, let's say, IP ranges that are in root footprint, but they're not in any child. So it can be matched only in the top level footprint. Uh, importantly, uh, there is an ambiguous matching within each name, namespace. So any given IP address will match to one, uh, to one uh, kind of uh, footprint uh, in the tree. Um, uh, next. Uh, Kevin is in the queue. So let's give Kevin the time here. Kevin, you have a question on this slide or, or actually on the prior slide? Um, I, I guess or, I had some questions on the prior slide. So it seems to me that 
this I haven't read the draft. I admit, uh, and I apologize. But we we seem to be mixing a, a number of things. Could you go back um, a few slides? Proposed changes. Okay, this seems to me like a whole new interface. FCI today, as defined within um, CDNI, we define the objects and we do, we specified Alto as the transport. Right. Um, this seems to be specifying a new interface with, you know, by adding uh, an, a new synchronous interface, which, which is somewhat outside the scope of our charter. So we'll need to talk about that. Um, uh, but but that, that's the concern I have right now is that um, this is not just adding a new footprint. This is actually changing the entire way that you retrieve information about footprints. Um, as well as the structure of footprints and what they mean semantically versus we never really conceived of dynamic, well, we conceived of dynamically changing footprints, but we never considered them within scope. Um, so we, we probably need to have a, a discussion at a higher level with respect to where this fits in our charter, but that's my comment and, and we can keep going. Could you explain the kind of where that kind of conflict with the charter? I'm not sure I got follow that. Um, well, our our charter says that we will provide a we will create an interface for asynchronous operations to exchange routing information. Um, we we can go and look at the requirements. We can extend it. I'm I'm just not sure how this fits with re building something new. And is this going to replace what we have with Alto? Is it going to complement what we have with Alto? Is it come something completely different? If it's something completely different, then it's a new interface that's not in our charter. Or, or we have to bend the the interpretation of the charter a bit. Um, but again, okay. I haven't done the full draft, but but we need to think about that. Yeah, but okay, okay. yeah, it needs to be clarified. I'm, it's not clear to me why Alto is involved here, but yes. So uh, I, again, uh, I don't think there's necessarily is a necessity to have that. I think it's uh, to have it on the common FCI. Uh, it's just that uh, the way that FCI FCI right now actually uh, expresses footprints but does it in a poor way and uh, we're just looking to improve that uh, kind of so they'll be consistent and used uh, in use consistently um so that's the reason i think that kind of discussions kind of again coming to the draft the consensus was that it's probably best home to be in fci uh but kind of it doesn't have to be right so so um i think that's it's certainly a point to discuss and yeah, I'm not I'm not arguing um, one way or the other since I haven't read the details, but uh, I'm just proposing that we may, as chairs, need to to address adjusting our charter. Okay. Um, so uh, you know, we talked about hierarchy. Um, so the, the, those are the, the examples of the new footprint type that will allow. As I said, more concise and flexible expression of footprints, so we can actually have complex Boolean uh, Boolean uh, expressions that uh, can uh, do things like uh, all uh, networks uh, in Korea but exclude these subnets, um, kind of. Uh, so and or there's kind of the uh, kind of complex complex uh, expression there, and we can use existing mail uh, functions like IP match that already exists. Uh, so the only thing that is needed uh, for um, on the mail side uh, is to extend the variable. So right now the mail supports uh, request and response uh, variable. So endpoint, basically a set of attributes that can be associated with the endpoint uh, uh, would be added here. And uh, with that, so uh, uh, one thing to mention that this is potentially supersedes uh, the union uh, footprint type that is uh, in, in one of the drafts, uh, pending drafts, that with that, I think we kind of, we don't need that necessarily to have that because it sort of does uh, Boolean and and more or Boolean or really. Um, so that, that's another thing that uh, it would impact kind of if adopted because uh, there's been sort of there's there was this effort to define complex footprint 
but it doesn't support uh, kind of complex Boolean, uh, Boolean expressions, and these are needed uh, for practical use cases when you're looking about uh, looking into defining uh, geographies and um, uh, actually uh, real world scenarios. Um, next. Uh, so um, namespaces, right? I, I talked about that. So, so uh, uh, briefly, the notion is that uh, DCDN may may have different geographical structure depending on the type of traffic it carries, and um, uh, the variety of ways it can be done at configuration level. Uh, so rather than uh, tie that um, kind of very uh, um, so tightly with kind of types of traffic. The, the, the idea is that this interface would expose namespaces and those names, namespaces can be associated with uh, configuration interface objects. So uh, like uh, can be uh, service uh, ident uh, identifiers, can be individual host, uh, host index or uh, uh, paths and so on. So, um, you kind of you may decide as DCDN, for example, to say that, oh, that's actual practical example. So uh, I'm I'm handling. I have a core and edge uh, sub CDNs in, within my network, and I'm handling VOD traffic uh, kind of from uh, from the edge. But live traffic is actually is is only always carried from one CDN. So depending on this, I may advertise different footprints depending on what kind of traffic that is. Um, so uh, that's one scenario, but there could be other other practical scenarios where you want to have different footprint advertising uh, depending on, on the type of traffic. So, so really uh, namespace mechanism supposed to be uh, broad and uh, kind of support uh, various uh, scenarios that um, uh, next. Uh, hold on a second. I lost my control here. Okay, there it is. So we are That's the end it. of it. Okay, thank you, uh, Alan. And I, I agree with the Kevin that um, a, I have to read this draft as well closely and, and make sure that um, the, the changes that you're proposing, how they are fitting in, in within the current charter, or this is something you know outside of the charter to, that we have today. But thank you. Um, I see Neer on the queue here. Yes, hello. Hey. Uh, yes. Just a minor question regarding the uh, structure of the footprint, the, the name for the footprint as it is presented. I, as I see in the draft, the, there is a footprint type and footprint value, just like we had in RFC 806. Um, but the but the if I recall correctly, in, in RFC 806, the value is a list of values. Uh, and here the value is a single one. So is it on purpose? Or, um, um, think that uh, this, it should be um, for, for which type is that? So for, for any type or? So any type, it's always it's always a list with the uh, additive semantic. So uh, if, uh, for example, country code, so the type is country code, and the value is the uh, U.S. a uh, list where U.S. and Canada. I think that. Um, I think list list is appropriate. So I think that if, if that was the way the original uh, original kind of so that should be kept this way. Yes. Okay. And, and still in. Yeah, the, I, in the... I suggest we would take that in the list near. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that would be the better place to 
have the discussion. A little bit running late here. I, I know okay. we've got open mic with a couple of topics that we want to cover, but would greatly appreciate if, if you can put your comments on the mailing list near. Okay. All right, so we've got a couple of topics on the open mic here. And the first one is uh, CDNI logging extensions. Uh, ben, I have the slides up. All right. Um, if you just go to slide number two, please. Sure. So I just wanted to, uh, the reason I, this is on the agenda is we did not finish this draft in time for 117. We expect it to have it ready prior to 118. And it's a fairly hefty draft. So I wanted to just take a few minutes to go through exactly what it is we put together and that you'll be seeing shortly. Um, I'm sorry, is, is the... Uh, is slide two showing now for motivation? Yes. It's, it's not, okay, it's just not popping up on my end. All right. Um, so the reason we're going through this effort is that 7937 does not really meet the requirements uh, of a large number of CDN participants as it stands today. And this stems from some extensive discussion that has happened amongst members of the SVTA in their efforts to implement um, the CDNI standards and the open caching variation of that in the field. Um, so a group was put together uh, and through extensive surveys of the participants and uh, many numerous discussions, uh, we developed a set of requirements for what we need to cover logging. So core to that, is a defined set of logging fields that match what operators actually care about. Uh, so that uh, you know that that was a huge effort in itself. And then around that, how do you combine those fields into various log record formats? Uh, how do you collate those log records into log files, or how do you stream the records for streaming applications? Um, how do you collect log files into larger collections or archives? And then how do you manage all of the metadata around these log files and, and handling them? How do, you, how do you name them? How do you transmit them, et cetera? And then uh, as a adjunct to all of that, once you have the log files, uh, is there information that is normally part of logs or part of raw log data that should only be visible to certain participants or should be obfuscated or redacted entirely to comply with uh, the privacy regulations of various jurisdictions. So that's, that's why we're going through this effort. Um, slide three, please. OK. Um, so for log records themselves, we wanted to have very clear definitions for every field that we care about. Um, we wanted to standardize things. And uh, we wanted to collect those fields into a, uh, a number of different sets targeting uh, certain use cases, those being billing, normal operations, and troubleshooting. Uh, so the draft as it stands today specifies uh, different collections of fields for different business purposes. Um, we also allow the inclusion of HDB headers, uh, you know, optionally supported into those log records, but the draft does not currently implement completely custom fields. So that's work we expect to tackle in the future. Um, but that's a, that on its own is probably equal to the entire rest of the scope of work. So that was kind of, uh, that was deferred in favor of putting something together that would be uh, kind of a, you know, least common denominator and uh, meet the needs of as many people as possible with the, the least amount of, of upfront work. Um, 
and then the you know and then we also have a configuration around how to configure that stuff uh, slide four please so log records once you've defined and configured your log records those have to be collected into files uh, which we call containers so 7937 defines a single file format based on elf um, but that's not in line with what operators uh, want to use and what they use today. Uh, so a number of other file formats are specified, including JSON, uh, protobuf, and CSV. There's also a facility for a container of containers, that being tarballs, uh, so that you can collect uh, you know, log, logs over some period of time or other criteria into a single file. Slide five, please. Um, log transports. So 7937 defines an atom index that has references to where you can find the all of the log files in question. It doesn't specify how to get the atom index. Uh, there's no transport specified for that, and endpoint discovery is left as uh, an exercise that's out of scope of the, the RFC. Um, we felt that this was insufficient and that there should be explicit definitions for how to communicate the endpoints for transmitting and receiving logs. So to that end, there are objects defined uh, for S3, SFTP, and Kafka. Uh, Kafka being a streaming transport, S S3 and SFTP for files, uh, in addition to adding a discovery mechanism for the 7937 endpoint. Um, you know, so we maintain backwards compatibility with 7937 with a small addition. Um, these these transports, uh, well, S3 and F SFTP anyway, um, work both in a push, push and a pull direction. Um, so the downstream can provide an endpoint where logs can be fetched, or the upstream can specify an endpoint that logs should be pushed to. Uh, slide six, please. And this was the uh, considerations for privacy that I was speaking of earlier. So there are a number of transformation configuration objects that can be used to both advertise transformations of uh, log fields that have been performed by the downstream or optionally allowing the upstream to configure transforms that should be applied to log fields. Uh, and this is a number of various mechanisms, including uh, truncation, uh, search and replace, encryption, and hashing. Um, and uh, this is this is actually one of the things that utilizes that uh, secrets draft from earlier uh, for transmission of things like encryption keys. Those transformations can also be combined into pipelines, so you can have multiple transforms applied, and that's on a field by field level. Uh, slide seven, please. So where are we today? We have a uh, completed Google Doc draft um, from all of the collaborative editing that's in the process of being converted into a final IETF uh, draft document. It's pretty large, so it may or may not be split. I don't know. I think you know 70 pages, I think, probably is too large. Um, for a single draft, and it, it it can be split along pretty clean lines into different uh, areas of functionality. So that's something we'll consider. Um, and then there's a number of things that we don't have in scope at all right now, uh, as you can see listed on the slide, and we will tackle those uh, in a future draft that'll live alongside the current draft. Um, so that, that's a summary of where we're at on this. Uh, are there any questions? Um, I'll get on the queue, um, no hat on. So I, I think um, from what you have presented and you know, this, this seems like um, interesting work 
And it, it sounds like something that really builds on what has been done uh, before, but is not sufficient. So I think the, the topics that you plan to cover in the draft uh, seems reasonable to me. Um, and I think uh, I, I look forward for you to submit the draft because it seems to be hitting all the, the key elements for how you want to log. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I, I would also point out that uh, we've we've made an effort uh, as far as we can to remain backwards compatible. So we're not deprecating seventy nine thirty seven. This is in addition to you know that's why we're calling it extensions. Yeah, my question was going to be along those lines. I, I see adding more transports makes sense. I mean, we had what we had seven years ago. There's new stuff. Exactly. Great. Yeah. Formats. Um, some of the transformations we'll, we'll have to get by sector. Obviously, if we're doing encryption or we're doing privacy related stuff, that's fine. We'll have to deal with that. My question was going to be um, with respect to the existing IANA registries um, for the new fields and stuff that you're adding, does it all still fit within that structure? And we'll just be registering new fields and new um, formats and new file types? Or, or do you have some new, I know you mentioned tarballs and things. Yes, we can add that on top but. yeah that, that that's a that's a good question um i don't think what is in this draft fits with the definitions of fields as such as they're defined in 7937 so it would be something new um okay. th th this is the 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 draft contains completely new definitions some of the definitions overlap with the fields as defined in 7937 uh, some of them are even named in similar ways uh, but they are defined very differently. So okay. um, I think that that's a really good question. I think that's something we should explore once we have the draft in place to, to facilitate discussion. Right. Obviously, if we can reuse stuff or if we can at least massage it in a way that makes it more usable, that would be preferable to just, you know, kind of building something new. But um, we can take a look once the draft is ready. Thanks. Chris. I'm getting some very faint audio, but yeah. I can't distinguish it. That mic doesn't seem to be working. Is it on? Um, maybe, Chris, you can use this mic up here. Now standing in the front of the room. Feel silly. Uh, I support this work. The uh, uh, I've attempted. Uh, to try to get 7937 to work for us, um, and it mostly doesn't. Um, and the thing, the places where it falls short are the places where this new uh, extensions uh, pick up the slack. So I, I really do think that this is a natural evolution, and it takes into account the, the intervening seven years of implementation experience coming back to the group and uh, trying to produce something better. So I am looking very, uh, I'm looking very forward to reading the draft, well, uh, reading the submitted draft and uh, uh, progressing it. All right, thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Ben. I, I don't see any other questions. Um, so thank you. All right, thanks. All right, so last topic of the day. Uh, Ellen, you get, you get the last word. Right. And if I can bring up your slides. Request routing interface. Yeah, so uh, this is work uh, that, uh, so I'm, I'm presenting this, but uh, the work actually was uh, done together with Guillaume and Yoav. Um, uh, and just uh, recapping, we kind of uh, first introduced this uh, uh, in the open mic session actually late last year. Uh, didn't actually submit the draft, so there's a plan to do that. Since then, we kind of worked on wording of this and the CTA, so I think we'll be ready to do a draft before, uh, before our next ITF in Prague. Um, the problem statement is that uh, existing uh, 7975 RFC specifies um, support for recursive request routing that is 
uh, uses kind of uh, custom JSON-based messaging, uh, which uh, has several drawbacks. I think there is complexity of implementation. So uh, several uh, UCDNs face difficulty actually implementing that. Um, uh, there is only support uh, for basic request transmission. So UCDN doesn't transmit the whole request to DCDN. Again, to kind of quickly set the stage uh, that we're talking about, right? So uh, request routing, recursive request routing uh, suggests that UCDN receiving the uh, request from the end user and uh, uh, kind of a consulting with DCDN about how to handle that and then returning the request response directly to the user in a way that uh, and the user then proceeds to, to uh, work with DCDN as opposed to uh, kind of uh, the iterative approach where a uh, user is um, when they actually the uh, UCDN defers uh, the, the request to, to DCDN uh, and DCDN then proceeds to respond to that. So uh, we're looking for better ways to support that. Then it was uh, done in 77975. Again, I mentioned the complexity of implementation, uh, ability to act on request only, uh, actually not providing the benefit of, of uh, latency reduction. Um, so we want to introduce a, a new uh, uh, mechanism for doing that, uh, that will, uh, provide a way to reduce latency so that could be kind of we uh, minimize the amount uh, number of time that there is a uh, round time trip request going back and forth uh, provide UCDN with a uh, desired for capability to control delivery so manifest control for uh, server side add insertion is one one driver there um, and uh, that will be something that will be supported only for HTTP forms of redirection, though. So actually providing that uh, mechanism uh, of uh, uh, request routing for HTTP, uh, HTTP um, request delegation. Um, next slide. So, Alan, we may not have time to go over all the slides. So any key things that you want to hit through in the next couple of minutes? Yes. I just want to so, save one uh, minute for the, before the time ends. The, the key features, right, is that, uh, again, we want to move from uh, JSON-based encoding to actually moving uh, requests and responses as is in the data plane, which will resolve the uh, challenge of uh, uh, implementation complexity and support to modes of operation so that uh, uh, be done on request and on response. And uh, um, kind of so the, the request mode or response mode um and uh, using the common uh, open caching interfaces uh for um uh, for this um so just just like other interfaces in uh, in the suite um and uh yeah so the and i think the next step for us would be really to submit the draft and um that has been actually uh on hold for a while so i think we'll, we, we should be ready to to produce that uh, fairly quickly so um, and uh, looking forward to the discussion on the list once this is done. Very good. Very good. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, Kevin, before we end, I'm going to pass it on to you for thoughts, comments. Uh, yes, we will follow up on the list with respect to the request for adoption. Um, we have some follow up to do on our existing working group drafts. Uh, we will get the uh, ACME draft submitted to the IHG. Um, other than that, everyone, obviously, as we always say, please go and read all the drafts. Please push your comments on the list. Um, and otherwise, uh, we will see you at the next IETF. Sanjay, any last comments? Yes. Uh, so the next IETF is in Prague. And uh, incidentally, the SVTA is meeting in Prague a couple of days before the IETF. So hopefully we will get to see some of you uh, in the next IETF session. And what we will do is as chairs, we'll make sure that we request for session uh, for the early part of the uh, IETF sessions. So maybe Monday or Tuesday, um, that way you can extend your SVTA trip uh, and, and uh, participate in the IETF in person. 
that's all. With that, thank you everyone for coming. Safe travels home, and we will see you at IETF 118. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, Ali, long time no see. <laughs> I didn't realize that you were seeing I saw you, but I didn't know that you were seeing me. How are you doing? Good. Yourself? Yeah, I'm doing well as well. Oh, man, Excellent. It's just been, it's just been so many years. I know. I wish I could have been there, but yeah. hopefully, hopefully sometime in the near future. All right. Well, you look uh, more or less the same. It looks like. Uh, so do you. That's good. <laughs> All right, safe travels. Sanjay, I'll talk to you later. See you, Ali. See you, Chris.